is a follow-up video to the one I made a few weeks ago where I talked about the relationship between locality and Bell's inequality. Now in this video, I'll be giving a little more details on that, and I'll be presenting a proof of Bell's inequality starting only from the assumption of locality. Now, whereas the previous video didn't require any uh, previous knowledge in, in mathematics, this one is going to be just a little more technical. Uh, and in fact, my plan for this channel is to choose a subject, so in this case, Bell's inequality, and start out with a video that is accessible to anyone, regardless of their background, and then make one or several uh, more advanced uh, videos with, with some more details. Now, in order to uh, keep everything nice and clear, I'm going to color code each video according to how difficult I judge that video to be. So the previous video I made, which ha required uh, no, no background, is a green video. This one is going to be an orange video, in the sense that it requires just a little bit of, um, of mathematics to, to follow. Um, in the future, I'll be making other videos, uh, some that will be technical but less difficult than this one will be yellow, and some that will be technical and more difficult than this one will be red. But before, uh, I, don't, I don't want to uh, scare anyone off, uh, the proof that I'll be presenting here is not all that difficult. And in fact, uh, to understand the statement of the theorem that we're going to prove, all you need to know is some basics in probability theory, so you need to know what a probability distribution is, as well as conditional probabilities and expectation values. And, uh, and then in the proof, I'll be manipulating some integrals, uh, I'll take some absolute values, take some inequalities. So if all of those terms are familiar to you, then you should have no trouble following, uh, following along this video. So let's get started. So let's start with a brief reminder of the main point of the previous video, which was that John Bell, in a 1964 paper, proved that quantum mechanics is not local following this uh, chain of implications, that locality, through the EPR argument, implies pre-existing values for spin, but pre-existing values for spin implies Bell's inequality. Now, since quantum mechanics violates Bell's inequality, that means that there are no pre-existing values for spin, and therefore that there is no locality. Now, in this video, I'll be presenting a proof of Bell's inequality, but I actually won't be presenting this implication here. Instead, I'll talk about a later theorem that was uh, published by Bell in 1975, which, in a sense, combines both of these implications. So in this, uh, this 1975 theorem, the assumption is locality, and locality directly implies an inequality called the CHSH Bell inequality. Now, CHSH stands for uh, the, the last names of the scientists who discovered this inequality, namely Clauser, Horn, Shimoni, and Holt. Now, I'll be talking about the 1975 version rather than the 1964 version uh, for two reasons. The first is that uh, this result is actually much more general, and it applies to pretty much any reasonable probabilistic theory of nature. And second, it has some elegance to it in that it goes directly from locality to, to the inequality without discussing anything uh, about pre-existing values. Now, let me note that the proof of, uh, of this implication is fairly significantly simpler than the one that I'll be presenting here. So I could have made a yellow video, maybe even a green one, uh, by talking about uh, this implication here. However, this, uh, this proof is very well known, and there are very many sources out there on the internet. Uh, if you're interested in, in finding this proof, um, you can um, go and fi find that fairly easily. So today we'll be talking about the proof of the 1975 theorem proved by Bell. So let me come back to the experimental setup that I described in the previous video, in which I have two observers, Alice and Blurb, who may be arbitrarily far away from each other. Now, Alice and Blurb are measuring properties of a physical system, and they do that using measurement devices. So that means that Alice and Blurb each have a measurement device. Now, what I'm going to add on top of the, the setup that I discussed in the previous video is that each measurement device is now going to have a tunable parameter. The tunable parameter will be denoted by alpha for Alice and by beta for blurb. Now, what is the, this tunable parameter? Well, in the example that I talked about in the previous video, uh, I, I was uh, talking about measuring electron spin. 
Now, it turns out that one can measure electron spin in any three-dimensional direction. So in that case, the choice of alpha and beta would be a choice of a direction in three dimensions in which to measure the spin. But in this video, I'm actually going to be more general than this and just imagine that each measurement device has, say, a knob on it and that this knob can adjust a parameter alpha for Alice, beta for blurb, and this parameter alpha is going to be in some set SA, which could be the set of directions in three dimensions for electron spin, but it could be something much more general. On blurb side, I have the parameter beta, which will take values in SB, which is another set, that may be equal to SA or not. It doesn't really matter. The theorem still holds either way. So Alice and Blurb get to set this parameter and then do a measurement. The outcome of this measurement will be denoted on Alice's side by xA and on Blurb's side by xB. And the only thing that I'll be requiring about this outcome is that on Alice's side, there should exist a lowercase a, which is a positive number, such that xA is in the interval minus a plus a. And same thing on blurb sides. Blurb side, there should exist a b such that xb is in minus b plus b. Now, in the, the setup that I talked about in the previous video, where we were measuring electron spins, the outcomes were either plus 1 or minus 1, which is obviously a, um, a special case of this, uh, of this more general setup. Now, these outcomes xA and xB are going to be represented as random variables that are distributed according to a joint probability distribution, which I'll denote by P alpha beta. This joint prob probability distribution may, it, it may depend on the choice of the parameters alpha and beta. So to summarize, uh, in this setup, I have two observers, Alice and Blurb, that each have a measurement device on the, each measurement device, there is a tunable parameter, which is alpha for Alice and beta for blurb. And they will um, measure the, the um, properties of, of their physical system. The outcome of the measurements on Alice's side will be xA, uh, and on blurb's side will be xB. Both of these are random variables that are distributed according to the joint probability p alpha beta, which depends on the choice of the parameters alpha and beta. So how do we include the concept of locality into this setup? So we have Alice on one side with her measurement device that is measuring xA, and Blurb on the other side with his measurement device that is measuring xB. Now the way that we're going to introduce the concept of locality is through uh, two probability distributions that are localized to Alice and localized to Blurb. So Alice's probability distribution will be a distribution on the value of xA alone and will depend only on the, the setting of Alice's measurement device, alpha. And similarly, Blurb's probability distribution will be a probability distribution on the values of xB alone and will depend only on beta. So to tell you what uh, the assumption of locality is going to be in terms of the joint probability distribution, let me actually first tell you what we will not do. A naive approach to defining locality would be to say that the joint probability distribution on xA and xB factorizes exactly into the probability distribution on, X, on xA times the probability distribution on xB. In other words, we're saying that the outcomes of the measurements uh, xA and xB are perfectly decorrelated from, the, from each other. There is no correlation between these outcomes. Now, this is way too restrictive. In fact, in the setup that I was talking about in the previous video, where we were measuring electron spins, electron spins were perfectly anti-correlated between Alice and Blurb. So if uh, we don't allow for correlation between these, uh, these random variables, then we're, um, we're making an assumption that is, is too strong and that we're not allowed to uh, explain the experiments that we want to discuss. So in order to weaken this assumption on locality, I need to go back to uh, the setup that we just discussed and add an extra degree of freedom. So to define locality in a way that allows for correlation between xA and xB, we're going to add an extra variable to our setup, which will be denoted by lambda. Now, Alice and Blurb are performing measurements on a physical system, and lambda encodes the state, the underlying state of that physical system. And one thing that's important is that Alice and Blurb may not actually know what that state is, which means they may not necessarily know the value of lambda. 
In uh, the previous video, I discussed an example where we had two billiard balls that had a marking plus one or minus one, but Alice and Blurb did not know which was which. In that case, after you've chosen which one is plus one and minus one, the, uh, the variable lambda would encode which of those billiard balls is plus one and which of the billiard balls is, mi is minus one. Now, in our setup, we'll be a lot more general than that, and we'll allow lambda to take values in some unspecified set, which I've denoted by capital lambda. And because the value of lambda is not necessarily known to Alice or, and Blurb, or to anyone for that matter, instead of, uh, of necessarily having a definite value for lambda, we are going to assume that it is a random variable that is itself distributed according to a probability distribution, which I've denoted by Q. And what's important here is that this probability distribution Q is independent of alpha and beta. I'll comment more uh, about why I've done this and the implications of that later on in the video. So now that we have this extra degree of freedom, we can now define uh, the concept of, of locality uh, in a way that will allow for correlations between xA and xB by considering conditional probabilities that are conditioned on the value of lambda. So we're going to define locality through conditional probabilities conditioned on lambda. So the condition that we're going to take is similar to uh, the one that I said we weren't going to use. Uh, but for the conditional probability distributions. So the conditional joint probability distribution on xA and xB, conditioned on lambda, should exactly factorize into the conditional probability on uh, xA times the conditional probability on xB. And in this way, we can have correlation between xA and xB, provided those correlations are encoded in the state lambda. So for instance, in the example of uh, the two billiard balls, uh, it's a simple exercise to check that if lambda encodes which ball has plus one and which ball has minus one, that this factorization is true. If that's not obvious to you, uh, you can easily prove this by uh, considering all of the, the possible cases and looking at the probability of those cases. And I'll, I'll leave that to you as an exercise. So the conception of locality that we're going to take is not uh, the exact factorization, but exact factorization of the conditional probability. And now that we have the concept of locality down, we're ready to state Bell's inequality. So let me start by summarizing the setup that I've discussed until now. So I have two random variables, xA and xB. xA takes values in the interval minus AA, and xB takes values in the interval minus BB. These random variables are distributed according to a joint probability distribution, p of xA and xB. And this joint probability distribution may depend on the choices of two parameters, alpha and beta. Now, in addition, we've introduced an extra variable, lambda, which encodes the underlying state of the system. And lambda is itself a, a random variable that is distributed according to a probability distribution, q of lambda, which is independent of alpha and beta. And finally, we introduce the notion of locality uh, as a, a factorization assumption on the conditional joint probability distribution. So the, the probability distribution p of xA, xB, conditioned on lambda, should factorize as a probability on xA, conditioned on lambda, times a probability on xB, conditioned on lambda. And within this framework, we can state Bell's inequality as a theorem. But first, I need to introduce uh, one small notation the uh, object of interest for the inequality is a correlation function, which is defined as the expectation value in the probability distribution p alpha beta, which I'm denoting by e sub alpha beta. So the expectation value in the joint probability distribution of the product xa times xb. So that's the correlation of xa and xb. I'll denote that by c of alpha beta. It depends on alpha beta through the probability distribution. And I can then state uh, the CHSH Bell inequality um, as, uh, as follows. So for, all, for every value of alpha and alpha prime, and for every value of beta and beta prime, C alpha beta minus C alpha beta prime plus C alpha prime beta plus C alpha prime beta prime is smaller than 2AB. That's the CHSH Bell inequality. So let's go ahead and prove this. OK, so let's get started. 
the first step is to write this correlation function, which, remember, is the expectation of xA times xB, uh, write it out uh, uh, using its definition. So the expectation of xA times xB is the integral uh, in the joint probability distribution, so integral over xA and xB in the joint probability distribution of xA times xB. Then the next step is to take this probability distribution and to split it up over the conditional probability distribution. So I can rewrite the integral over xA and xB as first an integral over lambda times an integral over xA and xB that is conditioned on lambda. Right? And now the term that I have here uh, is an expectation of the product xA and xB in the conditioned uh, probability distribution. Now, I can use the locality assumption, which says that this conditional probability factorizes exactly. So I can uh, write this out as a product. So this term is now the integral over xA, conditioned on lambda, times x, of, of xA, times the integral uh, of, um, over xB, conditioned on lambda, of xB. And now this term here is the expectation in this conditional probability of xA, so I denote this expectation by E uh, sub alpha uh, super A of xA. And this quantity here is the expectation of xB in the, the, the conditional probability over here. So in proceeding in this way, I've written this correlation function as an integral over lambda of this product of local expectations. Right, so now that I've done that, I can use this expression to re-express this combination of uh, expectation values. So let's take alpha, alpha prime, beta, beta prime, and look at uh, the correlation of alpha, beta minus the correlation of alpha, beta prime. By writing each one of these according to the first line here, what do I find? Well, I'll get an integral over lambda in both cases. And then in the first case, I'll find this product. So the expectation of xA times the expectation of xB. And then for the second term, I'll get minus the expectation of xA times the expectation of xB with the, the parameter beta prime. Right, so by using this, uh, this identity here in here, um, I obtain an expression for this difference. I can obviously do the same thing for the other combination of correlation functions that's important. So the uh, C of alpha prime beta plus C of alpha uh, prime beta prime, which naturally comes out as being the integral over lambda of the expectation with parameter alpha prime times expectation of xb beta plus expectation of xb beta prime. It's the same as I, as I did over here, except the sign here is different. And instead of alpha, I have alpha prime. So now that, that I've computed these, what I need to bound to prove Bell's inequality is the sum of the absolute value of this difference plus the absolute value of this sum, where the difference is the term that I've computed here, and the sum is the term that I've computed here. So I need to compute, um, or I need to bound the absolute values of these. And so if I'm taking absolute values, I need to add them here. And now I can get an inequality by taking the absolute value inside the integral. So this combination is smaller or equal to what I wrote over here, but with the absolute values taken inside the integral. So that's an integral over lambda times the absolute value of e alpha xa times the absolute value of e beta xb minus e beta prime xb. So that was for the first term here. And then for the second term, uh, I get it's the, the, the same line as above, but with alpha replaced by alpha prime, and this minus sign replaced by a plus. Right? Now, uh, I can actually get rid of this. How do I do that? Well, I notice that uh, the random variable xA is bounded by a, because xA is in the, in, in the interval minus aA, so its absolute value is bounded by a. If the absolute value of xA is bounded by a, then the absolute value of the expectation of a, of xA, sorry, must also be bounded by a. Right? So that means that I can get rid of each of these terms, provided I replace them with lowercase a's. 
I can bound them, up, bound them away this way. And so I'm left with these expectations uh, of xb with parameters beta, beta, prime, beta, and beta prime. Now, to bind, bound this combination, I'm going to use a very general theorem uh, that holds for any real numbers. Uh, I wrote it down, down here. So the theorem states that if x and y are in the interval minus bb, then the absolute value of x minus y plus the absolute value of x plus y is smaller than 2b. This is something that is very easy to prove. Uh, if you want to go ahead and check it, uh, what you do is you square both sides of the inequality, then you expand the squares out, uh, and you can the inequality follows very quickly from this expansion. And then since everything is positive, you can take square roots and obtain the, the inequality. here. So this is a general result that whenever I have two real numbers, x and y, in this interval, uh, this inequality holds. However, the combination that I have here is of this form, because for the same reason, I know that the expectation value of xb in absolute value is bounded by b. Right? So this uh, term plays the role of x in this, uh, in, in this line. So this is x minus y. And then on the second line, I have x plus y. And so I know that this combination is bounded by 2b. And once I combine that with the a that I got over here, I found, find an overall bound that is the integral over lambda of 2 times a times b. And since 2ab is independent of lambda, I can just take this integral, and the integral uh, over uh, lambda of 1 is just 1, because this is a probability distribution. And so I end up over here with 2ab. So in conclusion, I've taken this combination of correlation functions and shown that that is smaller or equal to 2ab which is the statement of the, Bell, of the CHSH Bell inequality. So we've proved that this theorem holds under these assumptions. What that means is that if we have a theory of nature that is compatible with the predictions of quantum mechanics, and we find that that theory predicts that Bell's inequality is violated, then necessarily, in that theory, at least one of these four uh, assumptions must be false. Now, what I've argued in my previous video, and will now argue in this video, the only real, uh, the only reasonable uh, possibility is that locality is violated. But let's double check this and go through the other assumptions. The first one here just says that the outcomes of measurements take values in bounded intervals. Now, in quantum mechanics, there are plenty of observables that take values in bounded observables, such as electron spin or photon polarization. And so th these take values in bounded intervals within the theory. And this has also been checked very extensively experimentally. And so one cannot reasonably uh, violate this, uh, this assumption. here. The second assumption simply states that our theory is a probabilistic theory. Now, quantum mechanics is very, very um, famously a probabilistic theory. And this has also been checked experimentally very thoroughly. And so uh, we can't reasonably expect that this, this assumption is violated. Now, the third assumption states that the probability distribution on the state lambda of the system is independent of uh, the parameters alpha and beta. This is incidentally called, this assumption is incidentally called statistical independence. Now, if you wanted to violate statistical independence, that would mean that the, choice, the choices that Alice and Blurb make to set uh, their, their measurement devices depend on the underlying state of the system. However, you can come up with experiments where Alice and Blurb cannot possibly know the underlying state of the system before they do the measurement. And therefore, they cannot possibly know the state of the system when they set alpha and beta. So we can't assume that the probability distribution on lambda depends on alpha and beta if Alice and Blurb cannot possibly know uh, the, the state lambda when they choose alpha and beta. So in a, a reasonable theory, this third um, bullet point must also not be violated. And this just leaves us with the possibility of violating locality. So what this means is that in a reasonable probabilistic theory that, um, that reproduces the predictions of quantum mechanics, if Bell's inequality is violated, then necessarily that theory must not be local. So today, we discussed a proof of Bell's inequality starting only from the assumption of locality. 
And this clearly establishes a connection between a violation of Bell's inequality and non-locality. So thank you all for watching. I hope this was elucidating. Uh, in my next video, in a couple months or so, I'll be talking about time reversibility and the concept of entropy. And I hope to see you there.